following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. This is Luke Wayne, a colleague of Matt Slick, filling in for him today. Uh, normally, I like to give you guys an update of what Matt's out doing when I fill in so that you know why you've got me on here. But frankly, today he didn't tell me. He just called and asked me if I could fill in for him. And so uh, why are you hearing me instead of Matt? Your guess is as good as mine. But I am grateful, delighted to be on the on the air with you guys here today, taking your questions. So give us a call at 877-207-2276. Again, that's 877-207-2276. For those of you who are new to the show, uh, this show is a uh, radio outreach of the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry. Uh, you can find us online at carm.org, that's C-A-R-M dot O-R-G, and we are a ministry dedicated to equipping Christians and defending the faith and reaching the lost for Jesus Christ. And so we are, again, a Christian apologetics organization. Apologetics is the branch of Christian theology that is focused on the defense of the Christian faith, on answering objections that critics and outsiders would bring to challenge the truth claims of Christianity, both for the sake of of evangelism, of removing barriers to the gospel, answering those questions so that people will be more open to thinking about and taking the gospel seriously as part of our gospel presentations to the lost, but also to strengthen the faith of believers who do believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, are trusting in Jesus, but don't have answers to some difficult questions that come up, or just honestly seeking, how do I reconcile these passages that seem to be in, in contradiction? How do I answer this evidence that claims to be scientific and says that it refutes something from the Bible? What about what my Muslim friends are telling me about these problems with the Gospels, or what my Mormon friends tell me about these other scriptures? How do I respond to these things? Well, that is what apologetics is dealing with, is presenting a positive case for why the Bible is true, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are true, salvation by grace alone through faith alone is true, but also answering those objections, providing a defense and saying these uh, these things that uh, critics of the Christian faith raise to try to show alleged problems with our faith are actually answerable. Uh, and so we, uh, that is what our organization has been doing for for decades now, when Matt first started CARM, uh, in the early days of personal internet, uh, by God's grace, he quickly recognized the need to use the tool of the internet to provide readily available resources for pastors, youth pastors, Sunday school teachers, and everyday Christians who are engaged in, in gospel conversations with their friends and neighbors, coworkers, and strangers on the street, to be able to have a place they can go to look up these difficult questions and look at solid research on these topics. And so Matt built CARM.org, and that grew into the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, which now has this radio show, and missionaries and translators in, on four continents and in countries around the world making these apologetics uh, materials available not just to English speakers, but to speakers of Portuguese, of Spanish, Turkish, a number of uh, local African dialects, and available through the Internet, through the airwaves, and in printed materials in places where uh, mass media are not as readily available, and to, uh, distributing those to equip Christians in every corner of the globe where God has graced us with the opportunity to reach. 
We are, as Matt likes to say, missionaries to the Internet, using uh, the connected media of computers and servers that allow a voice to spread around the world to be able to strengthen Christians wherever wherever an Internet access or a Wi-Fi signal is available, and then allowing those Christians to take those truths and spread them even farther by word of mouth. We, we're missionaries, but we want to help you be missionaries, too. And if you are listening to this, then that means you are a part of the English-speaking West, most likely. Now, I know we have listeners to this show, even in, in Asia, parts of Africa, and other parts of the world. But most people who are listening to this show are in English during this time of day, it's because you are part of the English-speaking West. And many of you, you have jobs, you have families, you're settled in a particular location, and you wonder, to what extent can I be a missionary? What does all this mean to, to, to me? Well, we make these resources available because we believe every Christian, right where you are, can be, should be a missionary. And just give you a few facts to realize, if you're listening to this in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, you may not think that you live in a major mission field where you can reach unreached peoples. But the fact of the matter is that the modern era has facilitated one of the most extraordinary times of human migration in history. For better or for worse, millions of people from nations all over the world are uprooting their, uprooting their lives and leaving their ancestral homes to pursue new lives in other countries, often in countries like the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, English-speaking, culturally Western countries. For some, this is to flee hardships. For others, to pursue greater opportunity. But whatever the reasons, as college students, as working migrants, for, for a number and a number of means, reasons, methods, people are on the move. North America and Europe, but just between the year 2000 and the year 2010, had 8 million people relocate from other parts of the world. That's 8 million to the USA, 1.6 million more to Canada, 1.7 million to the United Kingdom. Just during those 10 years, it's escalated since then. What's that tell us? Well, you could talk about all sorts of political or demographic, sociological uh, implications of these numbers. But what I'm concerned to talk about today, not to say that none of those other things are important, is the missiological implications. What does that mean for Christian missions? It means that, well, there are hundreds of people groups that have never heard the gospel that decades ago you would have had to get, get a passport and a visa, learn a language, find a new trade, or raise support and move to the other side of the world and start a whole new life to be a missionary to reach those people. And we certainly still need Christians willing to do that. But today, those financial barriers, those uh, borders of countries that you'd have to cross, the traveling expenses, the politics, all of those things that it takes for a missionary to overcome, to travel to some country in the Middle East or in Southeast Asia or Central Africa to be able to reach an unreached people group. Today, you can reach many of those same unreached people groups by just having the courage to strike up a conversation with a stranger at Starbucks. This is one of the realities of the modern era in which we live. Every one of us has the opportunity to be a missionary. This can look a lot of different ways. You might work with your church to start an English as a second language class that would allow immigrant immigrants in your community to come and learn English and, and better be able to integrate into society and, uh, and get jobs and have their economic security. And in that, at that same time, you have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. But 
wherever they are, on a college campuses, living in neighborhoods near you, there are people who have never heard the gospel, who are from an unreached people group, likely living in your hometown. They're Muslims, they're Buddhists, they're Hindus, they practice uh, uh, spiritist or animist local cultural religions, or they're secularized atheists like so many other parts of the world, like so many other people even in our own countries. But they need the good news of Jesus Christ, and we need to be ready to speak across worldviews, to step out of our own comfort zones and into theirs and share the good news of Jesus Christ. This is an incredible opportunity for Christians in this modern age. And most of, most Christians, it's not that they're necessarily unwilling to do it, but they don't realize the mission field is there. And they're not sure that they can answer the kind of questions that speaking to someone from another culture or another religion might raise. And that's where Christian apologetics comes in, where we, uh, organizations like CARM, but so many other great apologists out there outside of our organization, are laboring to provide those answers, to make them accessible, to make them easily reached, so that when the questions come up, you can say to someone, you know, that's a great question. Can I schedule a time to meet with you and get back together, and let's talk about that? And then you go look it up. And we try to be here for you, that when you do, you can find those answers on places like CARM.org. And so I encourage you, step out, look around your community, talk to people, hand out tracts, look for someone sitting alone in a coffee shop, at a bookstore, at a bus stop, and reach out and get to know them. Find out where they're coming from. Learn their story, hear their worldview, and then share with them. Ask them, hey, have you ever had the chance to hear what an evangelical Christian believes about how we can have eternal life or how we can be free from guilt and shame, how we can be forgiven of our sin, how we can have a relationship with God? Would you mind if I took two minutes of your time to, to share that with you, and then I'd love to hear back from you what your thoughts are. And then you, you have a conversation, and you be genuine. It's not a script. Get to know the person. Listen to their response. Look up answers to their questions. Be a missionary right where you are, and we have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with nations, tribes, and tongues who have never heard without even leaving our home city. Prayerfully think about that. And maybe you've got some questions on how you can reach particular neighbors. Give me a call at 877-207-2276, and I'll be here to answer those questions and jump on the phone lines when we get back after this short break. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Welcome back to the show. This is Luke Wayne filling in for Matt Slick on this Friday. Uh, and give me a call. Let's talk at 877-207-2276. Would love to hear your questions. Uh, speaking of which, let's jump to the phone lines now and speak to Alberto from Georgia. Alberto, you are on the yes. air. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Wayne. Oh, t- talking about you, about evangelism and all that, but I, that's not my question, but I said about thousands of tracks all over the buses, the, inside the, the restaurants, put them on people's windows. Even to SCAD students in Savannah, Georgia. I mean, I, I think about 30,000 tracks or more, and, and Sunday school books and everything. 
by myself alone. Going oh, praise God. Yet, praise God. And churches ain't doing it today. Like the churches today are not doing it. And in, in the last 10, 15 years, they ain't, the churches are not evangelizing the communities. They're not going to the streets. They're too ashamed of the gospel. I don't know what it is. They don't care or what. But that's my little piece of testimony I've done. Anyway, my question is, uh, I heard this program but one time, but this guy talking about the 5G, about the CIA, been using that to, to control people's minds and all that stuff, make them do things, you know, signals to their brains and stuff. Do you think that's true? It's possible, but I don't. I don't think it won't work against the Christian because the Christian got the mind of Christ and look at by God's power and with all His Spirit protect us from all kind of uh, these scientific uh, things they use for 5G to control people's mind with signals and all kinds of stuff. No. What do you think about that? Well, fi- yeah, 5G just has to do with the speed that the data signal is on your phone. So before that was 4G, 3G. That, that's um, that's just the the speed of data transfer on cell phone signals. So no, that's um, cell phone signals are not able to control the human brain. Um, so those uh, when you see a 5G device or things like that, that is just a, a data transfer speed. You don't have to you don't have to worry that that's something that that a government or anybody or corporation or anything is using to control you. Um, so. Yeah, there are certainly uh, governments that desire to spread false information and and control people's behavior, but they're not doing it through 5G technology or or waves directly into our brain or anything like that. Nothing like that is going on. Mm -hmm. All right, because I heard this Christian program. I don't know if I'm going to mention the lady's program, but... She had this guy talking about all kinds of crazy stuff on there about, about control and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was kind of hard to believe. <laughs> so much stuff yeah, this, on this program. There, there are so people I, who I who, who will say who will say all kinds of say all kinds of things. And uh, um, but you know, I, I, as far as far as I'm concerned, we we use those devices. We use the the, the the internet and, and our phones and the the ways that we have to to get the gospel out and use those as ways to equip equip Christians and and reach the lost and and spread the word. Uh, so there's uh, obviously we need to be responsible in our time and it can consume us in that way. But there's nothing technologically about five G devices that is uh, controlling the human brain. So not 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 yeah, the sort of yeah. thing we need to worry about. Uh, so yeah. hope that yeah, hope that sets you at ease a little bit there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use the technology for texting, send videos on Facebook programs. I share max licks, you know, programs to my friends and family, so people can know the truth. So I use my I use my cell phone. I could text fifteen people mm-hmm. in less than fifteen seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have. Uh, it, I mean, the devices can be a distraction, and we we need to be careful and have uh, have um, self control in those ways. But they're all, they also do provide us an an opportunity if we use them rightly and responsibly to to be able to to reach more people uh, with the gospel. Uh, that does not replace, you know, as you mentioned at the beginning of the call, handing out tracts and talking to people one-on-one. Nothing will ever replace a, a person-to-person interaction and really connecting with yeah. someone and sharing that truth. But in addition to that, using the technologies we have in our day, just like back in the, the Protestant Reformation, uh, the Reformers were able to spread the Word of God like never before because they capitalized on the printing press. Uh, that new technology that allowed the spreading of the Word of God in, 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 to degrees never before seen, uh, they, they used that and used it to the strengthening of the Church and the reaching of the lost. And I think we can do the same with the technologies we have today. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes, I know, like you say, giving the trash to people, but sometimes people are in a rush, sometimes, you know, in the streets. Sometimes they're not always going to sit down with you. and Some will, some won't. Some of them, you know, sometimes I just just give it to them, and I put the information, my church number and address, and address. If they're interested, they can always contact the church and location of the church. So that's why I used to give about thousands, I mean 30,000 tracks, not including Sunday school books and other 
magazines and uh, you know from the church that gave me I, I ask everything anything possible anything information about God or something I just give it out to people in the streets. <laughs> yep, and that there's always uh, going to be know. people who are too bu- who are too busy or who don't want to hear, but we we take every opportunity we can to graciously and lovingly yeah. show with share with anyone who will listen. Um, and so. Yeah. Thank you for calling, Alberto. Appreciate oh, appreciate right. your all question. Right. Appreciate your time. All right, you have all right. a Thank have you. a wonderful Thank weekend. You too. Thank you. All right, that was Alberto from Georgia. Call in with your question eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. Let's jump right back on the phones and get with Cameron from Idaho. Cameron, you are on the air. Hi, um, I just had a question um, that just has to do with, uh, since we're getting close to election times, more political, when when you're, you know, in the political environment here in America with votes and stuff coming up, what is the responsibility of a Christian as far as their moral responsibility for who they do or don't vote for? Not that they have to pick one in particular, um, but when you have a party that promotes basically the mirror image of the sins listed in Romans chapter 1, when a, if a Christian chooses to, to vote for that, is at what point does it become sinful, or what, what do you think about that? No, oh, no, that is that's definitely one of the uh one of the questions questions that ev- uh living in a edit society where we vote for our leaders and and in some cases vote for our laws as various uh uh amendments or things like that may may come directly to the voter in your state. These are things that we have to think about is what how do we use our vote? And of course, to some extent there is Christian liberty to weigh out when you have a bunch of imperfect, um, often unbelieving candidates who will stand for one righteous thing, but then in another area of their platform will be, be standing for something wrong. And, and it is a challenge to weigh out um, the, the priorities and, and place those votes. But there are certain lines that absolutely cannot be crossed. And... Uh, Oh, we're coming to a break right now, and so we will talk a little bit of that more. Cameron, if you could stay on the line with us, we'll talk a little bit more about some of those lines and how we navigate those issues right after this short break. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Welcome back to the show. This is Luke Wayne filling in for Matt Slick this Friday afternoon. And give us a call at 877-207-2276. Excited to take your calls on matters of biblical theology or Christian apologetics church history, world religions, would love to hear from you guys. So give me a call, 877-207-2276. So before the break, I was on the phone with Cameron from Idaho. We'll be jumping right back on with him for a second, who was calling to ask about a Christian's responsibility in uh, politics in a democratic modern society like where we're at right now, especially coming up on an election society, uh, cycle. How do we decide how to use our vote in this fallen world, weighing out the moral issues? Are there candidates who a Christian simply ought not vote for? And so let's jump back on with Cameron and continue that conversation. Cameron, you are back on the air. Okay, thank you. Sorry if there's any noise in the background. I just happen to be driving at the moment, but I have a headset on. Totally understand. Totally understand. So did I summarize your question okay there? Uh, yeah. The main, main reason I was okay. thinking about it is I know that there's, you know, individual Christians who are at different levels of understanding or, or ignorance when it comes to what the Bible teaches or what a particular party pushes. And I think primarily my question would come down to people that are, in fact, well-informed. Uh, for example, 
You've got the the candidate uh, Raphael Warnock, I believe, in Georgia, who has been a pastor, supposedly, you know, is an acting pastor for many years, and yet is upholding a Democrat Party platform that I would say is objectively contradictory to the Bible, evil, you know, pushing homosexuality, transgenderism, or, you know, baby murder in the womb for just a few things off the top of my head. And from where I'm sitting, I think someone like him, who cannot claim ignorance of what the Democrat Party pushes or what the Bible clearly teaches, I would say that that man is clearly in sin. Um, A political choice does not save or damn you, but certainly uh, I I think sin can come into play there. What what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I can't speak to the specific candidate that you're that you're talking about simply because I don't know who that who that is I haven't heard of them myself but the principles that you're bringing okay. up uh, I, I can I can speak with definitively and that is that yeah there are lines as I started to mention before we hit to the break there are lines that biblically we just absolutely ought not cross and if a candidate comes on and we like some of what they're saying, some of the benefits that their policies might bring to us or uh, economic ideas or kind words that they, uh, that they fill their, their speeches with, and they're, they're, there might be things that we'd look at their, their, uh, their promises and their platform and say, that sounds pretty good. But if they add on to that, and also we're going to slaughter innocent children made in the image of God uh, and uh, punish those who would attempt to spare the lives of those children, that's a line we can't cross. There's, there, there's no ambiguity on that issue. And uh, there's th- th- this, this is something that the, the Bible is absolutely abundantly clear that fundamental to Christian ethics, fundamental to, hu- to human ethics that apply to all mankind, is that man is made in the image of God, and therefore to take the life of an innocent person who has not themselves committed a capital offense deserving of death, to take upon ourselves to decide that someone will die for our own reasons and to take the life of an innocent child, unborn and unable to have gone out and broken a human law or committed a a human legal wrong in that way, um, there's, it's indefensible. However, we may emotionally feel about the situations that put someone in that, oh, that might tempt them to do it. We're still, ultimately, when it comes down to it, we're talking about the murder of an innocent child. And to say that should be legal and that should be protected and those who oppose it should be silenced, when that's part of of somebody's political platform, we cannot support that candidate. Likewise, Speaking of the image of God, in the same passage that establishes that God made man in his image, there in uh, Genesis 1 and uh, 26 to 28, God said, let us make man in our, Im- uh, in our image after our likeness. It goes on to say, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And Jesus appeals to those very words as the foundation for marriage. That marriage is the joining together of a man and a woman, that the two become one flesh. That's from Genesis 2. And he likewise said, from the beginning, it was not so, about divorce and all those things, saying that um, male and female, he created them. Jesus points to that. The image of God is the foundation for marriage. And so it is a profaning, not merely of a social institution, but of the very image of God in creation, God's intention for mankind from the very moment he spoke us into existence, breathed life into us from the dust of the earth, that God's intention was that we would be male and female, mother and father, husband and wife, man and woman. And so, again, 
a policy that attempts to abolish what God has made the most foundational element of human relationships and human society. Um, man and woman and the and sexuality confined to the marriage of a man and a woman. Uh, that is a fundamental thing, an absolutely core. It's at the again at the foundation of of the most basic human relationships that all society is built upon. And so that's that's a non negotiable. That's something at the at the very heart of what God made human society and relationships and family and interaction to be. And in fact, when God created mankind in his image after his likeness and made them male and female, man and woman, husband and wife, and that and, and marriage and sexuality founded on that fundamental reality was inherent in God's stated plan for man from the very moment of creation. And so I agree with you. These are lines that the Christian can't cross. We can't say, well, because of our complicated political situation and and the emotions in our culture and, and sensitive situations, that therefore we're going to defy not secondary Christian doctrines, but fundamental things that are definition to what it is to be human and all of Christian ethics. Does that uh, answer your question yeah. on that? It does very much. Thank you very much. No problem. No problem. Did you did did you have any further further questions on that? Any follow up there? Um. No. I I think you uh, okay. cleared that up well. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Thank you for calling, Cameron. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And. All right, that was Cameron from Idaho, and you know he he brings up an important thing for us to consider. He, you know, his initial question is, "What is the Christian's responsibility in politics?" Now, not every Christian has a responsibility to run for office. Not every Christian has a responsibility to canvass for this or that particular law or candidate or things like that. We have a responsibility before God to proclaim the gospel and to live uncompromising in light of his truth, to, to be faithful to him and fear him and not men. Now, within that responsibility, that will have impact on our political lives and our various situations. And so living in a democratic society, that will shape our vote. It should shape our vote. It, it, it should shape our, our political stances and our, our, our ethics and our position, because ultimately, the Word of God is true. And while I can't legislate someone else into believing that, nor should I, as God has not given me the authority or jurisdiction to do that, I still must live in light of the reality, not the theory, not the possibility, but the reality that Yahweh, the triune God of Scripture, has spoken all things into existence, that we are dust and borrowed breath, living by the mercy of the Spirit of God, and our ethics are right and are wrong, the fate of our nation rests in His hand. That should drive all that we do. We'll be right back after this short break to get back to the phones and more of your questions right after this. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Welcome back to the show. This is Luke Wayne filling in for Matt Slick in this last episode of the week here on Friday, November 4th. And joy to have you guys with us. Thank you for taking some of your time to uh, to listen in to Matt Slick Live. And if you uh, didn't have time to call in but want to explore your questions further, 
uh, go to our website at CARM.org, that's C-A-R-M dot O-R-G, where many of the questions that people call in with have been answered previously in carefully researched but often short and to-the-point articles. Uh, we have a library of information there at CARM.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G. Would love to have you guys come check us out there. And uh, if you have some thoughts on something that we haven't written on, that uh, would be a benefit to the site, write to us at info at CARM.org. That's I-N-F-O at C-A-R-M dot O-R-G. We would love to hear from you there. But if you got time, we still got 15 more minutes. We'd love to hear from you. Phone lines are open at 877-207-2276. That's 877-207-2276. And let's get back to the phone lines now. We have an anonymous caller from North Carolina. Hi. Uh, you good are evening, on brother. the air. Yeah, my mom was a, my mom was a little creative. Uh, well, or she couldn't think of a name, so just call her anonymous. So anyway, uh, thank you for what you do. My question is: about a month ago, I'd heard about uh, running out of diesel. You know, running out of food, and which I have, but I need, what is your opinion, if you would? I saw it again today. We have, now we have 11 days left of, of, uh, diesel. Uh, nothing would surprise me anymore. You know, I, I really, truly feel like we are, you know, uh, we have all the signs and all that type of thing that we are in the last days. Um, but I'm just, I'm curious if you, if you would. Well, the what the you, truth of the matter think? is, when it comes to when it comes to our fuel supply and oil economy and things like that, that is well outside my area of expertise. So, oh. um, whether okay. there is a a risk of a risk of running out of diesel fuel and and things like that, I I wish I could speak to you with any authority or knowledge on that, but unfortunately, I cannot. It's not something that I've ever uh, done any any meaningful research on and would would okay. not be able to, to give you an overly helpful answer on that. Right, right, right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, we support your station and uh, appreciate the truth. Oh, so, thank you. All the we best truly, you, and God bless you. You, mm. you too. God bless you as well. And sorry I couldn't be more thank help, you, but sir. thank you for your prayer no, no, and your no, support. That, that's fine. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you, Luke. Good night. All right. You too. You too. Have a great night. Okay. So phone lines are open. Give us a call at 877-207-2276. Yeah, there are many important questions and concerns in the, the world right now, and no no one person can be well-researched on them all. And I know when it comes to a lot of current events, um, politics and economics and things like that, I personally am particularly lacking in that area. So forgive me for the gaps in my knowledge, but that's that's where we are. Uh, but what I can say is that, you know, we we certainly do live in difficult times, times of of uncertainty where people are facing a lot of challenges. Prices are going up. A lot of people, their job situations, their medical situations are strained. Um, they're they're concerned about where things are going politically. They're concerned about losing liberties. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of concern. And there's a lot of of genuine things that it's very understandable for people to uh, to be to be worried about. I I totally understand. And yet we serve a sovereign God. We serve a God who is in control. In times of plenty or in times of want, in times of favorable politics or times of, of challenging or even tyrannical laws. I've had the privilege to meet with 
brothers and sisters living in truly totalitarian countries where where building churches are, are illegal, where people gather in underground seminaries to train pastors, where such uh, institutions are, are not allowed to be established. And Christians living in that environment have taught me so much in their ability to still rejoice in the Lord, their ability to still trust and hold on that whatever happens, God will care for his people. That doesn't mean we won't go through very, very difficult times. But it does mean that in those times, as Jesus has promised, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Our Lord is with us, and He is in control. All is in His hands, and and the words of Philippians 4 are true. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. We set our minds on the things of God, and we trust Him that not that he, that he won't let anything bad happen to us, but that when he does, that he has a purpose in it, that God will bring about good. As James writes in James chapter 1, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, not just persecution, not just um, resistance for preaching the gospel, not, but trials of, of, of many kinds. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet these trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, Let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for no one, the one who doubts, is like the wave on the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person will not suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What's that saying? We ask God for wisdom. And how does he teach us wisdom? He brings those trials those struggles into our life that when they have their full effect, make us perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How do we lack nothing? We go through trials. Then he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, well, he already told us what makes us lack nothing, the trials that God brings us through. So we ask for wisdom, and God will bring difficult things into our lives to teach us that wisdom. And through trusting him, through faith in those trials, we will grow in our wisdom, in our knowledge of the Lord and our trust in His ways. And if we ask, and then the moment something goes wrong, the moment God brings the trial into our life that He's using to teach us the very wisdom we ask for, if the moment that happens, we lose faith and say, God, what's going on? What are you doing? He's doing what you asked Him to do. He's teaching you wisdom, and it is good. It doesn't feel good at the moment, but it is good. God teaches us through those times of struggle. We learn wisdom. We grow. Romans 5, 
Paul taught something similar. He said that, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him. We also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. We trust our sovereign God. We rest in Him. We rely that even in the hard times that come, and they will come, but even in those hard times, God has a purpose. He has a plan. Our suffering is not in vain. It is not for nothing. God is good. You know, in the Gospels, Mark chapter 4, we read the story when Jesus and his disciples were crossing over the Sea of Galilee, and a great storm came upon the ship, shaking it, pouring water in. The, the disciples believed all was lost, and they ran and shook Jesus and woke him up. Master, don't you care that we're, we're going to die? Don't you care that this is happening? Jesus step up, stepped up and rebuked the wind and the sea, said, Peace, be still. And immediately the wind and the waves were calmed. They obeyed him. He said, Why are you afraid? Do you still have so little faith? And then they were filled with great fear. Hear this, verse 41. Then they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? That was the right fear. They recognized who this Jesus was, the master of the seas, the Lord of creation. He is the one we fear. And when we fear the Lord Jesus Christ, when we fear God, we need fear no one and nothing else. What are the schemes of man or the throes of worldly trials against the almighty hand of God himself? If God is for us, who can be against us? I hope that is some encouragement to you as we go into this weekend. These are difficult times, but our Lord has overcome the world. Hold fast to him. Go in peace, and we'll see you on Monday. You guys have a great weekend. Another program powered by the Truth Network.